Jain, sir, very nice to have you with us today, uh, Shugatada, Professor Sugatada Jain. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of the London Story, TLS, uh, we welcome you to this uh, first of a series of, uh, of discussions on the idea of a nation. Uh, let me just give you a brief on, on the London Story. We are an independent human rights organization re registered in the Netherlands. Um, the foundation aims to investigate, advocate, and engage on issues of human rights abuse and humanitarian crises. Uh, this uh, time from 1920 to, uh, 2020 to 2023, approximately, we are monitoring the rise of ultra-right majoritarianism globally with a focus on India. We study hate speech and push for advocacy and accountability on social media platforms. We record incidents of violence involving state and non-state actors uh, globally, but again, uh, with a focus on, on India. Um, Professor Sugata Bose, uh, the Gardner Chair at uh, Harvard University. Uh, he had his early education at Presidency College in Calcutta, went on to Cambridge to do his PhD. He's the author of several books. Um, and and uh, of course, uh, Nationalism, Democracy and Development, but the one that we are most um, uh, most relevant, which is most relevant for today, is His Majesty's opponent. Uh, Sugata Da, incidentally, is also Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's grandnephew. Uh, today, the 23rd of January, uh, is the 124th birth anniversary. So it's a great honor that we start our, our uh, um, series of lectures on idea of a nation with Netaji. And uh, the... the um, the study today, what we will be concentrating on is uh, the relationship between Gandhiji and Netaji um, and their idea of an integrated India. We will be talking with uh, Professor Gata Bose about, Gandhi, about Netaji's life, his work, his relationship with Gandhiji and uh, anything else that uh, um, uh, Sugata Da feels uh, is relevant today. So um, Professor Sugata Bose, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, uh, I'm very glad to hear of the good work uh, that the London story is doing and promises to do for the next few years in the area of human rights. Uh, there is a, a rise of uh, majoritarianism uh, across the world today, and democracy has been under siege. Uh, there has been a bit of relief in the United States of America, but uh, here in India, uh, and uh, elsewhere, the struggle for democracy and human rights uh, uh, still goes on. Uh, on Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, uh, let me begin by uh, recalling their very first meeting. After resigning from the Indian Civil Service, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, returned to India on the same ship with uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And upon his uh, arrival in Bombay in July of 1921, he rushed to see uh, Gandhiji the same afternoon in Mani Bhavan. And uh, he apologized for his European attire and then bombarded uh, the leader uh, with a series of questions. And he was particularly eager to understand how Gandhiji could have promised Swaraj within the year. But... Uh, he plunged into the freedom struggle uh, under the leadership of Gandhi, but also Deshobundhu Chittaranjan Das in Bengal. And for the next 20 years, he took part in the nonviolent, non cooperation movement and the civil disobedience movement. Now, there were certain differences uh, uh, which emerged in 1939, leading to a very temporary uh, parting of the ways. Uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Uh, uh, could see that uh, in the 20 years from uh, 1921 onwards, the Indian civilian masses had all rallied uh, to the call of Mahatma Gandhi. But uh, Indian soldiers uh, were still loyal to the British King Emperor. And he wished to take advantage of the international war crisis in order to change the loyalty of Indian soldiers uh, away from the, the British Empire and to the cause of uh, Indian freedom. 
Now, where Gandhiji and uh, Netaji were absolutely at one was that they believed in equal rights uh, for all the religious communities of India. Uh, both believed passionately in Hindu-Muslim unity. Uh, Gandhiji had shown the path uh, during the non-cooperation movement of 1920 to 1922. And it was Netaji Shubhash who took it to its climax uh, when he united Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, and also all of the linguistic groups of India, men and women uh, in his Azad Hind Forge and movement between 1943 and 1945. That was his crowning achievement. And Mahatma Gandhi recognized that. So seven days before his own assassination on 23rd January of 1948, uh, Gandhiji uh, said that uh, uh, no other leader uh, had uh, elicited so much affection and loyalty from all the different communities of India as Netaji had done. And uh, following uh, that great leader's example, he wanted Indians to banish all communal bitterness from their hearts. Um, yeah, I want, to, I want to touch on that as well, uh, uh, Shugatada, because there, there is this entire um, uh, life that you see of, uh, of Netaji. Uh, um, Subhash Chandra Bose was born in an affluent uh, family. He was a part of the intellectual elite. He was destined for greatness. For He was, he was a leader from a very young age. But he was Subhash Chandra Bose, and he was Subhash Chandra Bose when he went to England and he, he studied, when he uh, got his degree, joined the, got, uh, got through to the ICS, resigned, uh, came back, joined the Congress. He was still Subhash Chandra Bose. And then something happened in 1939 uh, after the, the, the conflict, Sita and where he, he beat uh, Gandhiji's opponent, uh, a candidate, and uh, got arrested. Uh, house arrest, and then escaped. And that, that, that journey that he took, and by the time he got to Singapore and started leading the INA, he transformed from Subhash Chandra Bose to Netaji. All of a sudden, from this great leader that people were ready to follow, we had a leader that people are now ready to die for, my father included. Mm -hmm. What was that change? And what was that thing that, that changed him from Subhash to Netaji? Uh, yes, interestingly, in uh, 1939, Rabindranath Tagore had addressed uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose as Desha Nayak, leader of the country. But uh, the masses, of course, uh, were able to change that to Netaji, uh, revered uh, leader. Eighty years ago, uh, the great escape of Mohanishkraman took place from this house where I'm sitting, um, 38 by 2 Elgin Road in Calcutta. After going on hunger strike, uh, Netaji had been sent home, but was still kept under very strict police and intelligence surveillance. And he called my father, Shishir Kumar Bose, who was then a 20-year-old medical student, asked him to sit on his bed next to him and asked a searching question. Can you do some work for me? And that was to help him plan and execute the escape from Calcutta. Uh, so they planned for more than a month. And then on the night of 16th, 17th January, 1941, uh, my father drove his Ranga Kakababu, his radiant uncle, uh, out of this house uh, at about 1.35 a.m. at night. And uh, they drove uh, all night. And on the 17th of January, 1941, during the day, he was kept hidden in a place called Barari. And then again, on the next night, uh, he was driven to the Gomo Railway Junction. Uh, that was the first step in the transformation of Shubhash Chandra Bose to Netaji. And uh, he was, of, of course, in disguise as Muhammad Ziauddin. Uh, Mia Akbar Shah, one of Netaji's closest followers, had come from uh, the Northwest Frontier Province and helped in uh, purchasing uh, clothes for the disguise from the Wachel Mullah shop. Uh, in Calcutta. My father and he jointly did the shopping. But what is quite fascinating is that it was my father who drove him from Calcutta to Gomo. Then he was alone from Gomo to Delhi and up to Peshawar. But who received him there? 
It was Mia Akbar Shah. Then when he decided to travel from Europe to Asia and undertook a perilous uh, submarine voyage, a 90 day journey, uh, who was his only Indian companion? His name was Abid Hassan. And on 23rd January this year, uh, he's being given the Netaji Award uh, posthumously. And uh, once he arrived in Southeast Asia, he became the Supreme Commander of the Indian National Army. He established uh, the Azad Hind government in Singapore. But look at the people around him. Uh, the commander of the first division uh, of the INA, which fought in Imphal, uh, was Muhammad Zaman Kiani. Uh, he named the three leading brigades of the first division after Gandhi, Nehru, and Azad. The Gandhi brigade, which fought in Imphal, was uh, commanded by Inayat Jan uh, Kiani. The man who uh, raised the Indian tricolor in Moirang near Imphal was Shokat Malik. Uh, the man who was uh, his only uh, Indian uh, companion uh, on his final aeroplane journey uh, was Habibur Rahman. And the three officers uh, who were tried at the Red Fort were Prem Kumar Saigal, uh, Gurbak Singh Dhilan, and Shanawas Khan. Even from these names, you can see that he had united everyone. The man, the INA officer who built the INA memorial in Singapore at his orders was Cyril John Stracy. And I remember your father very well, Imran. Mahabub Ahmed, who gave a Netaji oration here at Netaji Research Bureau, Netaji Bhabun, after retiring as our ambassador to Canada. But much later, I was once in Patna, in your home, and I was trying to film an interview with uh, Uncle Mahbub. And as I rolled the camera, he would, you know, break down and tears would flow down his cheeks. And he said to me that, look, it, it's been so many decades, but here I am becoming emotional, I'm breaking down. And this I have seen among practically all of Netaji's followers, men and women. I've seen this in Lakshmi Saigal, in Janaki Thevarati Nappan. And then once he was able to speak, he said something very significant. Um, Habu Ahmed told me that he had the good fortune of working with Gandhiji uh, for a few months before his death, you know, after the war. He said he had a chance to work with Jawaharlal Nehru because he joined the foreign service. But then he said, but you know, there was only one man that I was prepared to die for. And I was prepared to die a thousand times. And that was Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. So he had a certain quality of leadership. He would not ask any of his followers to take any risk that he himself would not take. And they could see that he loved them. You know, just as he loved his country, uh, he had a profound love uh, for those who were prepared to follow him in the fight for India's freedom. And they returned that love in full measure and gave him unmatched affection and admiration. So that was, you know, Netaji. Uh, you know, he, he, he was everything that they had. And because they knew that each one of them meant something to him, were dear to him, those who were prepared to risk their lives for India's independence. Absolutely, and I, I've heard this. Uh, I've heard several people, uh, Captain Ram Singh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, Uncle Gurbaksh, the whole lot. That they were yes. they they were ready to do anything, anything uh, whatsoever. And that's what is interesting. Again, he did unite. Uh, he never uh, differentiated on the basis of anything, not even gender. Right. Everything was 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 equal for him. Yeah, and and that I think was a great achievement, which, as you said, even Gandhiji recognized. So there is still one controversy that people, uh, you know, because there's not enough information about, about uh, Netaji, so it's very easy to make up things. And I think a lot of people have done that over the last uh, uh, several decades. Uh, one of the things that is, is, is asked often is the relationship that he had with Germany. Now I know why, uh, because he was fighting the British Empire. And, you know, but I want in your words to understand a man who believed so much about putting people together 
was now taking help from people who didn't believe that at all. Uh, and, uh, and that's a question that is asked often as to why uh, and how uh, did the INA and uh, Netaji uh, manage to get so close to somebody like Adolf Hitler and why, why would he do that? Well, he was, uh, he was not close to uh, Adolf Hitler. In fact, when he was in Germany uh, in 1936, uh, he visited briefly. He actually went to all of the European countries uh, between 1933 and 1936. Uh, and uh, when he left Germany, he denounced the new German nationalism as narrow, selfish, and arrogant. Uh, he had also been critical of uh, Japan's in, uh, invasion of China in 1937 and sent a Congress medical mission uh, to China uh, as president of the uh, Indian National Congress. So ideologically, he was completely opposed uh, to, uh, to, to Nazi Germany. Uh, and it was not a very simple uh, uh, principle of uh, the enemy's enemy is my friend either. Uh, I gave the answer to the question that you are asking when I said that he felt that he had to reach Indian soldiers who had been successfully kept insulated by the British from the swirling currents of civilian mass discontent uh, between 1921 and 1940. And he felt that the final struggle for India's freedom had to be an armed struggle. And where could he get access to these Indian soldiers? Only where they were prisoners of uh, the enemies of Britain. And that is why he went via the Soviet Union, while the German-Soviet pact was still in place, uh, to Europe. And it was Germany and Italy who were holding these you know, Indian soldiers. But as soon as Germany invaded the Soviet Union, he could see that his plan of an armed thrust from the Northwest uh, was not going to materialize. And so he began to turn to Asia. And after Japan reached the gates of India, they took Burma by March of 1942. He was quite determined. In fact, when Singapore fell in February 1942, uh, he felt that he had to come to Asia. Unfortunately, it took a year. And that delay proved to be crucial for him to be able to organize that journey by submarine to Southeast Asia. In Asia, he, of course, recruited the professional soldiers who had surrendered on behalf of uh, the British Indian Army to, uh, uh, to uh, the Japanese in Singapore. Uh, but uh, he also uh, decided to recruit uh, Indian civilians. And so most of the professional soldiers happened to come from uh, groups that the British had called mar martial races. There were many from Punjab and the Northwest Frontier Province, but most of the civilians in Southeast Asia were from the South of India, uh, Tamils in, in a great majority. They too were taken into the Indian National Army. So he was able to completely destroy uh, the spurious British anthropological theory of uh, martial races and castes and able to build a genuine Indian National Army. Um, even in small battalions, they were mixed from different communities. They all dined together uh, and sang uh, famous Azad Hind Forge Kawalis like Jai Hind Ka Nara Gun Jutha, Hatho Me Tiranga Tham Liya, before they went to fight together and shed blood for the country's uh, uh, independence. So I think we have to uh, understand that uh, his external alliances uh, give uh, no insights into his own ideology. He believed in an Indian form of socialism. He was very fond of using the term Samya Vada, which can be loosely translated as egalitarianism. So equality and unity were his uh, watchwords. And he certainly believed in equal citizenship. And he gave equal Indian citizenship to all of the overseas Indians in Southeast Asia under the auspices of the provisional government of free India. And finally, you know, he was always opposed to narrow nationalism. His nationalism was something that was very broad and, uh, and generous. 
Uh, and that is something that we really ought to remember and emphasize uh, today. And that is, that is what we're discussing and looking at today uh, in India too. We, we see, uh, I think that's where he and Gandhiji were very, very, very similar. Of course, Gandhiji um, was, had taken many years to put this together and there were still a lot of issues, I think, uh, with, with the Congress party and the way it moved uh, forward. Uh, and Netaji in just a few years had managed to do something which was absolutely incredible. And I think Gandhiji recognized that too. Both these leaders have been uh, misappropriated over the last several decades. Um, uh, Gandhiji by, again, all sections of society, uh, excluding the right-wing section. Netaji, unfortunately, by this group and they feel that that he is their voice and that's becoming more and more apparent now uh, of course they, they, we will talk about uh, the bengal elections later but um, uh, how how does that happen how do they believe that he is their man and that he spoke their language when he was uh, i think at least openly antagonistic to to uh, narrow nationalism uh, how did this happen Netaji was not only opposed to uh, narrow nationalism, but in his time, uh, he was very strongly opposed to the Hindu Mahasabha, which was actually quite a fringe political group in those days. The Indian National Congress was a much uh, larger uh, uh, political uh, force. Uh, I don't think it is that easy to misappropriate uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose because uh, his life is crystal clear. Uh, his uh, ideals were lofty. And anyone uh, who has uh, studied his life uh, will, uh, uh, will see immediately that uh, he gave equal rights to members of every different community and no one had achieved religious harmony uh, in the way uh, that, that he did. But uh, I think it's worth uh, looking at both the similarities and differences between uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shuhash Chandra Bose when it comes to this question of equality among all religious communities. Gandhiji evolved over a period of time. During the non-cooperation movement, when Netaji came and joined uh, Gandhiji's uh, struggle, uh, Mahatma Gandhi had achieved political unity. His closest political comrades in those days were Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. Uh, but uh, Gandhiji would not even sit down to dine together with them. Uh, at that stage, he did not believe in intermarriage between members of different religious communities. On the other hand, if you read Shubhash Chandra Bose's writings and speeches, even in the 1920s, he's talking about the imperative of cultural intimacy among India's different religious communities. And he's also saying that his political goal is the creation of India as a free and federal republic. So, he, he is very clear about that. Now, Gandhiji changed because Netaji was so successful in uniting Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians in his Azad Hind movement that when they came as prisoners after the end of the war to the Red Fort and the Kabul lines, uh, Gandhiji went to visit them. And... Uh, the INA prisoners told Gandhiji that under Netaji's leadership in the INA, we had absolutely no differences. And here the British are offering us Hindu tea and Muslim tea. And Gandhiji asked, uh, you know, why do you suffer it? But the INA soldiers replied, we don't. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea equally half and half and then serve the same with food. And so Gandhiji laughed and said, that is very good. So he had completely changed his views on interdining by the mid 1940s, uh, even on intermarriage when he was in Noakhali, 
in late 1946 and early 1947. He was asked this question very directly. And he said that there was a time when I did not support uh, intermarriage, but my views have changed. Uh, so he was, he was able to change with the times. But Shubhash Chandra Bose was, you know, very clear from the, from the beginning. You know, as you were mentioning, his life of uh, service, uh, seva, public service, began very early, even as a teenager, uh, before he became involved in, uh, you know, politics. Uh, and if you read his writings, he says that, uh, you know, I grew up in Kotok in a neighborhood called Oriya Bazar, which happened to be a Muslim majority locality. And when I grew up, I had Muslim friends and there was absolutely no discord. I grew up with having Muslim friends. So this sense of cultural intimacy between Hindus and Muslims came to him when he was very young and he continued that all his life. Also, it is important to remember that his political guru, Deshobandhu Chittaranjan Das, um, uh, forged what was called the Bengal Pact for equality between Hindus and Muslims of Bengal. And Shubhash Chandra Bose supported it. And uh, Deshobandhu un unfortunately died in 1925. And uh, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose wrote a wonderful essay on Deshobandhu saying that, you know, uh, Deshobandhu was a devout Hindu, but he had no dogmatism in his mind. And that's why he could love Islam. And that's why the Muslims believed him, trusted him, supported him. And he carried on that Deshobandhu political tradition and took it to new heights uh, in uh, the Azad Hind movement. Shukatanda, one more thing, because we keep talking about his religious unity. But I think there was another thing as well, which is always a touchy subject when it comes to Gandhiji and, and several things in India today. And that was caste. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe at all in the caste system. While he united all the religions, he also was completely uh, egalitarian when it came to the caste system in India. For him, there was no caste. You were Indian and that was it. And I'd like you to touch a bit on that too, because that's a very important thing that people don't really um, credit uh, Netaji with. Yes. You know, uh, I, I've heard this uh, uh, anecdote from Abid Hassan himself, that in Singapore, the priests of the main Chetia temple uh, came to invite uh, Netaji. And, you know, at that stage, the Azad Hind movement needed funds. The Chetias were the richer community uh, in, uh, in that area. Uh, but uh, Netaji refused their invitation, saying that go to your temple where you don't even allow the subordinate castes to... Uh, you know, enter, not to mention uh, people belonging to other religious communities who are equally near and dear to me. And Abid Hassan uh, said to us that he was actually somewhat dismayed because it meant that a large contribution for the, uh, you know, freedom struggle in Southeast Asia was being forfeited. But then a few days later, the same priests returned and they said, that they wanted to hold what they called a national demonstration in that temple. And the temple will be thrown open to members, not just of all castes, but also all communities. And so Netaji went, flanked by Muhammad Zaman Kiani on one side and Abid Hassan on the other. People belonging to all castes were present, including very poor uh, subordinated caste, uh, rubber plantation workers of Malaya. Uh, uh, Abid Hassan said, I saw the black caps of many South Indian Muslims in the gathering, the national demonstration. So uh, basically what Abid Hassan said was that Netaji would refuse to compromise. You know, if you are going to discriminate along lines of caste or creed, then, you know, I will have nothing to do with you and I will fight you. And uh, it's something that he also put down before going on that famous hunger strike in 1940 in a letter to the government, where he said, uh, forget not that the grossest crime 
is to compromise with injustice and wrong. He just would not compromise. Uh, and that's why we have to follow that dictum uh, and uh, yeah. just not allow uh, people wh whose actions are the polar opposite of his ideas yeah. to appropriate him. Uh, you know, they very selectively um, think of him as a warrior hero. He was brave, yes. Courage was one of his character attributes. But that was not all. Uh, he was of a philosophic bent of mind. He had a very clear conception of what uh, the social and economic reconstruction of India should look like uh, after freedom. And that's why it's far more important today uh, to remember his ideals of uh, equality and unity. Those who are uh, against equal citizenship in India can never be acknowledged as true followers or admirers Absolutely. of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Absolutely. And, and the other thing which uh, you and I were discussing the other day, in fact, um, the two very important parts of the INA, um, of course, one, the fact that his ashes are lying in Japan. And the second one, which is a very, very important thing too, are that um, every INA soldier, the, the oath they took, before they went to battle, was to return the remains of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last emperor of India, back to India. And as I mentioned to you, I have taken delegations to almost every prime minister except the one now, um, requesting that just a handful of Bahadur Shah Zafar's mitti, just a handful, can be brought back to the Red Fort to fulfill the promise of thousands, uh, unsung, who are dead and gone. People don't even know their names. In fact, Indian history has recorded just three people. It's Netaji and then the three that the British took to court. Everybody else, they've forgotten. So it's, it's really unfortunate. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy that you brought this up. Now, we have the elections happening now. We have elections in Bengal. One of the things that India seems to be very good at is that they put even national leaders into little boxes. So Maulana Azad became uh, a Muslim leader. Uh, Gandhiji, Gujarati, Banya leader, but yes, he had a little wider appeal. And Netaji has become a Bengal leader. So now you have Bengal elections and all of a sudden everything is Netaji, Netaji. That's another really unfortunate thing because if anything, Netaji was truly not just a, a, an Indian leader, but he was India of that time. I've been to Pakistan uh, mm -hmm. where I have seen INA families in Pakistan talk with the passion that we do. I saw uh, General Arshad, um, RM Arshad uh, yes. at Red Fort, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in 1986, when he came and hoisted the Indian flag, when we did the delegation, the drive from Singapore to Delhi, uh, the Chalo Delhi Chalo uh, drive. So he he's more than just an Indian leader. He's a full South Asian leader. And yet he's being appropriated as a Bengal leader now and being used for an election. What, how do we counter things like that? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, let me just say a word about Bahadur Shah Zafar and uh, Netaji. I myself went to Bahadur Shah uh, Zafar's tomb uh, in Rangoon in 2015 to pay my homage. And how can we forget that Netaji held a huge parade of the Azad Hind Ford just outside Bahadur Shah's tomb? And he recalled how, under Bahadur Shah's uh, leadership, uh, you know, Hindus and Muslims had united in the great 1857 rebellion. And he quoted a Bahadur Shah Zafar uh, couplet, Ghaziyome bu rahegi jab talak iman ki, takht London tak chalegi teg Hindustan ki. And, you know, he again gave the Chalo Delhi cry, which he had first given on the 5th of July of uh, uh, 1943 on the Padang of, of Singapore. And it's such a great pity that a little bit of earth uh, from that Bahadur Shah uh, tomb is not being brought back uh, to India. And Netaji's uh, mortal remains are still in, uh, in Japan. I think it's really uh, uh, appropriate in some ways that Netaji's last rites were conducted by a Muslim comrade in arms, Habibur Rahman, uh, according to Buddhist rituals. <laughs> and uh, his remains are in a Buddhist temple in, in Japan. 
In fact, can I can I just say something because I was yeah. talking to Habibur Rahman when he was still alive, and yes. he said a very interesting thing to me. Uh, mm. He was on his deathbed by then, yes. uh, poor man. He was very unwell, and he said, "You know, I had to cremate Netaji twice because when I was in Kashmir, there was a a, 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 a raid, and he said I had uh, portraits of Netaji uh, I, under my bed uh, because I was a great fan of Netaji, and he said I had to burn them all, and then he said finally." I had to give the fire to the, the body of Netaji. So he said, I actually cremated him twice. Mm. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah, yes. so sorry, I, I cut you. Yeah, and also uh, Netaji never, never uh, uh, would uh, accept being uh, seen as a Bengali leader or, or a leader of Bengal. And in fact, Abid Hassan used to say that we could never tell that he's a Bengali excepting when he ate fish. Otherwise, they, put, they would never be able to figure out that he was a... Uh, that he was a, a Bengali. And remember, the, uh, Bengalis were rather few in number uh, in the Azad Hind Forge compared to people belonging to other communities. So I have found that uh, in other states, there is uh, equ equal, if not greater, uh, devotion uh, to Netaji. And of course, uh, he completely transcends uh, the, the divide uh, that took place uh, in 1947. And like you, uh, I also have been in touch uh, with, uh, uh, with INA families, the family of Muhammad Zaman Kiani. I met even quite recently his daughter, Zahida, and his son-in-law, Farid. Uh, I met uh, uh, Colonel Dara's daughter and son, uh, Neelam and Sheri Hussein, recently uh, in, in Lahore. Uh, you were mentioning Raja Muhammad Ashad. Uh, I uh, remember meeting him. He gave the Netaji oration here in Calcutta in 1996, a very moving account of his role uh, in the Azad Hind, uh, Hind movement. Uh, so yes, uh, um, you know, first of all, had he not died in eight, on the 18th of August, 1945, I think he was the one leader who had the trust of all of the different religious communities of India. He had the implicit trust of the minorities and he would have worked out an equitable power sharing arrangement and perhaps would have been able to prevent the tragic uh, partition. But also I think if we followed Netaji's ideas, then we wouldn't have embittered relations between India and Pakistan. We would be able to form uh, a genuinely uh, strong uh, South Asian Union, even while acknowledging the sovereignty of the different nation states that have been created uh, by now over the, uh, uh, over the decades. And also let us not forget that Netaji, by destroying the prized instrument of British imperial rule, the British Indian Army, paved the way uh, for the liberation of the you know, whole of uh, uh, Asia. Uh, because um, Indian forces could not be used again uh, in, you know, Burma uh, or, or Malaya or could not go to the aid of the French and the Dutch imperialists elsewhere yes. in, in Asia. Yeah. And that's why when Nelson Mandela came to Calcutta after the end of apartheid at a big meeting in the Eden Gardens Cricket Stadium, he said uh, that, of course, they respected Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, just like your father, Mahabub Ahmed. But he said... Uh, but uh, your leader, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, was also our leader because he inspired the youth of Africa, anybody who wanted to fight for liberation from uh, Western colonial rule. So he, he, he's, he transcends Bengal, he transcends the partition lines of 1947 uh, to have real following in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, and elsewhere in South Asia. And also in some ways he belongs to, you know, all freedom loving peoples in Asia and Africa and beyond. And we must not really allow him to be used in this way for a state election uh, in, in Bengal. I know why this is being done because uh, um, the, the BJP is very desperate to make inroads in Bengal. And we are facing a, a, a quite a major challenge because in Bengal, there was this kind of a moment of crisis in 1946-47, when for a very brief moment, the Hindu Mahasabha's call for partition uh, gained traction. 
Uh, and unfortunately, the Congress High Command then followed that path and did not support uh, leaders like Gandhiji or uh, Jay Prakash Narayan or uh, uh, Ram Manohar Lohia or uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who, as he said, was thrown to the wolves mm. uh, with uh, the partition. And without his rebellious son, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, by mm. his side, Mahatma Gandhi by himself could not prevent the tragedy of the partition. But we can still learn from the, their ideals. Uh, um, and after all, Gandhiji referred to Shubhash Chandra Bose as a patriot of patriots. It was Netaji who was the first to address Gandhiji as father of our nation in this holy war for India's liberation. We seek your blessings and good wishes. So I think South Asia today needs both Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. And there was really no difference between them from 1942 onwards, once Gandhiji launched the Quit India movement. Their aims and ideology were quite the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Professor Sugata Bose, thank you very much. We really enjoyed that. It's been, a, uh, it's been a lovely conversation and I hope a lot of people are going to listen in on this and, and learn a bit more about Netaji because that's, I think, one of the big problems that we have. We don't have enough information. There doesn't seem to be uh, the will to do the right thing when it comes to that anywhere in, the sub, in, the, in South Asia. So we have, don't have that anywhere in the uh, subcontinent. Pakistan has now started learning a lot about uh, Bhagat Singh. I hope they will do that about with Netaji as well. Uh, India, I hope we start understanding the role of Netaji. When I went to Mount Popa, uh, where there was the major battle, yes. uh, Indian soldiers died, Burmese soldiers died, Japanese soldiers died, British soldiers died. All of them have a memorial except India. We have to respect our martyrs. We can't always pretend that, uh, that we... Uh, that we are great nationalists, but we do not want to do anything for our martyrs. Uh, thank you again. And I hope we'll have you on again at some point to discuss more uh, on, on Netaji and several other things. Uh, thank you very much. Jai Hind. Carry on the good work. Uh, Jai Hind.